Namaste. Humility is an interesting topic to me because I think we've got it all wrong in the West um, because of our unique situation. I don't think you can be humble unless you first know that you are in fact okay. And if you have a huge self-esteem, well, even a moderate or a small self-esteem problem, you can't be humble. Because what ends up happening is we act as if. And we, so I have a self-esteem problem. I hear that I ought to be humble. And I probably do it by beating myself up, which isn't what humility is about. It's, there's a, a concept in Buddhism called a near enemy, which means it looks like a virtue, but it's just a little bit skewed so that it's not actually a virtue anymore. It actually does damage. And I'm not aware that there is a near enemy to the idea of humility in Buddhism, but if there in my world, a near enemy to humility would be self-criticism. Because it can look like humility from the outside. But on the inside, it's really a running down of self. So I could say, for example, uh, and it would be true, I'm not very good at spatial relationships. It's hard for me to look at a bowl of food and go to the cupboard and get the right size container to put it in and cover it up and put it in the refrigerator. The odds are I'm going to think I need a much bigger container than I really do. Now, that's pretty benign. But if somebody says to me, hey, would you put those beans away? There's a big difference between saying, well, I'm really not very good at it. Do you know what size container I should use? Or saying, you know, I'm really not very good at that. I can't do it right at all. I, no matter how hard I try, it never comes out right. And yet, I'm really talking about the same thing in only a slightly different way. It's related to the idea that in the East they say, we should take our ego apart. But they mean a little something by, different by ego. They mean this idea that there's a permanent me that will never change. Because we in the West kind of think of ego in the Freudian sense, this a healthy sense of self. That I need to have a healthy sense of self. And I need to have it, in fact, before I can start taking my ego apart. And I need to have it before I can start taking on the virtue of humility. There's uh, the story about the guy who says, trying to show how humble he is. You know, I'm quite a sinner. In fact, I'm probably the biggest sinner the world has ever seen. I'm such a horrible sinner that I do nothing from morning till night but sin, sin, sin. And you almost think he's going to cross over into, in fact, I'm the best sinner the world has ever seen. And so there's this That's subtle... You're quoting St. Paul. Kind of. And he might have been there. <laughs> there's kind of this flip that happens where uh, you, you're, it looks like you're identifying something that's a weakness. But then you can't really tolerate that because ego strength isn't there. And so gradually you flip it from a weakness into still a weakness, but one I'm awfully damn good at. <laughs> <laughs> and, and therein lies, I think, our struggle with humility. I, I think we do better to look at the beginning of humility as maybe two things. Number one, a lack of attachment to outcomes. In other words, I'm going to do my best 
going to do what I think is right, but I recognize that in the end, it's not just me who's going to determine the outcome of this. And if it doesn't happen the way I think it should happen, I'm going to say, well, what could I do? I did the best I could. That's fine. That's the beginning, I think, of a healthy humility. And the second step, or the second quality of a healthy humility, is saying, it's closely related to the first, I'm not in charge anyway. I mean, if I'm not in charge, ultimately it's not my responsibility. Whether things go right or things go wrong, if I'm not in charge, I can say to myself, again, I did the best I could. Where we get into trouble is when we start to believe we're in charge. We start to believe we can control the outcomes. And then people who do things that stop our outcome from developing become those idiots who got in my way. <laughs> and, and, and that is where we cross out of humility. And we start getting into this place that says, well, can't you see that I always have the right idea? But when we do that, again, it's because, I believe, I'm not so sure that I am okay. I'm not so sure that I have the right idea. But I don't want to let you see that because then I'm vulnerable. So I'll just talk louder. Like at last night's wedding, yesterday, well, the wedding was in the afternoon, the reception was at night. It wasn't surprising to me at all that the young man who wore the kilt was the loudest guy at the reception. Because if the kilt won't get you enough attention, maybe if you get drunk and yell and scream, that would be. And we can look at it and say, oh, what a terrible guy. No, he's not a terrible guy at all. But he's not sure if he's okay. And so he does things to get attention. And if he gets attention, in his mind, he's been validated. For someone like that, it doesn't do any good to say, you know, you really need to be more humble. Because in a strange way, all this attention-seeking behavior isn't about him being full of himself. It's really about him being empty of himself in a negative sense, not in an Eastern sense. It's about him saying, I don't know if I'm okay, but maybe if I wear these clothes that nobody else is wearing, uh, I'll be, you know, it'll be okay. People will think it was cool. And people did say it was cool. I was gonna mention he forgot to shave his legs, but I thought, uh, you know, he obviously needed the esteem, so I wasn't gonna do that. And then as he and his friends got louder and louder later in the night, I started to understand. And I believe the humble person encountering that says, that's okay. They need to work through this. I don't need to go over there and say, could you hold it down? Now someone by the end of the night might have had to say that to him because the pitchers of beer were flowing fast and free. But that wasn't the time. I've always been kind of confused by this story about uh, the guest that Jesus tells. Which is not humility. Yeah, it's like, he's saying, oh, go sit in the lowest spot, and then they'll ask you to move up, and you'll get your ego fed. That way, if this companion's always sitting in the back of the church. Roman Catholics, and yeah, that's at the waiting. But when you invite them up, they don't move. Uh, it's... I absolutely agree that it's best not to like sit in the place that you know is probably reserved for somebody in particular. It's, it's kind of like people who go to weddings and the first row or the first two rows, sometimes even the first three rows are reserved for family, but they're going to go around the outside and sit up there anyway because they want to be close to the action. And sure enough, the usher has to come down and say, uh, out you go. But on the other hand, going to that last seat can be equivalent to wearing a kilt or talking real loud. Going to that last seat and hoping against hope 
that somebody recognizes that you are in too low of a spot. Risks, if you're that unsure of yourself, the possibility that nobody will notice you're in the last row, and then you're going to be devastated. Now, of course, we live in a different social time than, than Jesus' time when he was on the earth, and there's different meanings to where you sit. It's, it's not that strict now, but isn't it better to walk in and say, okay, I'm pretty sure the host is going to sit there, and I'm not going to really spend a lot of time standing here calculating what the most manipulative seat to take might be. But I'm also not going to take the best one. The other way, the way that Jesus describes it, kind of reminds me of people that go to wedding receptions and say, oh, I'm not sitting in that chair. I won't be able to see the couple. And, when, and they say it out loud, and it's kind of like saying to the other people, what do you schmucks can sit there? Because <laughs> I don't really care if you get to see. It's about me. And ultimately, I think, that's the other thing about humility. It is about not being attached to outcomes. It is about recognizing we're not in control. And so it is about recognizing there's only so much we can do. But underneath it all, it's recognizing that it isn't all about any one of us. And instead, it's really all about all of us. Amen. <laughs>